Good afternoon to everyone. Many thanks for joining us today for today's webinar, How It's Made Surgical Instrument Manufacturing. A um, few people are still joining us, so uh, I'll just run through um, a couple of points while, while they come online. So first of all, once the uh, webinar is finished, if you could please uh, fill out the survey, it should, you should get an automatic notification after the um, webinar finishes to go through a very short survey. It will just enable us to um, uh, issue you with CPD because we need uh, certain details that we then can allow for the creation of, um, of, of the certificate. So that would be great. Any uh, questions you have along the way, please uh, put them in the chat. There's um, uh, There should be a question feature that you send through. Uh, I can then hopefully work out how to look at them and answer them by the end of the session. Um, and there will be a recording available for this session that I can send around and you can send to colleagues. So if you have people who, uh, colleagues who haven't been able to attend who may wish to listen, they can do so. Um, and then you can you can send their um, their details on afterwards. Uh, so I think we'll um, we'll start now um, because uh, I think we're, we're five minutes or so behind schedule. Okay, so we're talking about um, surgical instrument manufacturing and how the, how the instruments are made. So I like to look at this as a, from the point of view as a recipe. So you have a technician, obviously who's trained to make the instruments, the surgeon who uses the uh, instruments and, and may come up with the uh, the idea, a need. So where where are the, uh, the is the instrument required, and um, for which ailment is it required to to, to fix? Um, the materials used for the instrumentation uh, and the know-how to create these um, create the instruments from these materials and of course if the um, device is a commercial viability is it something that's going to be needed in the marketplace so here we have a, a, a lovely bright shiny picture of a, an instrument um, you'll see um, obviously very aesthetically pleasing um, when when they're brand new when the instruments are new however there's much more to the instruments than just beauty and the same can be said for certainly for the surgical instrument makers as well. So this is me as a, a scrawny 16 year old um, learning uh, how to manufacture instruments alongside my colleague Mark. Um, so we're introducing the surgical instrument maker, aka the technician. So nowadays um, in the UK, traditionally they're known as surgical. We're known as surgical instrument makers, but quite often you'll hear surgical instrument technicians. The, ter the terms may be, interchange may be in interchangeable, um, but uh, yeah, so it's um, it's uh, obviously, it, it all depends what country you're in. And also sometimes it's used for, um, uh, from the point of view, like if you're a repair technician, you might, you might hear some, um, some, some different terms. So I did some research for this particular presentation we're going back here to um, not 1747, so uh, a, a, a little while ago, and this is in a, um, a, a trade journal here, which was advertising for um, to parents for their children who may wish to um, become a surgical instrument maker. And it was stated that no special strength was required to be a surgical instrument maker, which I think uh, perhaps that's what my parents had in mind for me. They knew knew, knew perhaps this could be the uh, the, the choice of trade for me and and, uh, and and I would fit the bill for this. So a brief bit of company history and how the, how I became a surgical instrument maker. So our company story dates back to early 1900s. Um, my, uh, my grandfather's uncle, George Paul, opened his first surgical instrument making um, factory in early 1900s in London. He was joined by his two nephews, George and Fred, um, who eventually started their own businesses, which my father joined um, and uh, trained to be an instrument maker as well. Uh, he left and started Surgical Holdings in the late 80s, and I then joined in, in the mid 90s and um, uh, trained to be uh, to be an instrument maker, uh, starting with a variety of different instrumentation, um, including some of the veterinary instruments, which some of them were quite interesting and, and intricate to make at the time, including things like horses' tooth rasps, but many of which used, um, uh, I say tooth rasp, tooth, basically like a toothbrush, many of which used the same sort of skills that you would as a surgical instrument maker to make surgical instruments. 
So here we have a, a diagram which shows um, the the evolution of the surgical instrument maker. This is uh, a, I've, I've um, copied this across from a journal article that I found during my research for this um, for this presentation. Uh, and it's it's a it was a it's a journal article that I think was from the from the mid 80s, but it's really uh, I'll share the um, uh, the source if you wish to look it up because it really is very interesting. It just shows here how the surgical instrument maker came from the flint tool a flint tool maker, um, bronze tool maker incorporated elements of carpentry, working with ivory and uh, silverstone ivory potentially for handles which we which were used uh, many many years ago. Ultimately, lots of different skills, including elements of black blacksmithing, come together. Um, that were that were then, uh, I guess, headed under the banner of a probably a cutler, razor maker, that then eventually became, at the as we know it, the surgical instrument maker, taking on lots of different skills, lots of different crafts, and and we're going to run through a few of those today, and the sort of um, the sort of skills that you might um, that you might see. Uh, when uh, depending on which instruments being manufactured, so we'll go through some practical examples of those. So yeah, the surgical instrument maker modern day really has uh, come straight from the caveman, from ha how they used to, uh, obviously in the Bronze Age and, and Stone Age, would fashion tools for for particular purposes. Mm -hmm. So we've we've come all the way down from uh, for, for, from those um, obviously many many years ago. And this is just to share the uh, the, uh, the journal article that I that I mentioned that I'm referring to from from the late 80s. Um, I'm, I'm happy to share this on on the on the chat after. It really is worth um, worth having a read through to get a real um, grasp of ha historically how surgical instrument makers evolved in the UK. And surgical instrument makers, generally speaking, as as from our perspective as a company rely on apprentice, uh, apprenticeships. So this is a picture is of our, our factory manager, Terry Coe, receiving the Souter Prize at the Royal College of Surgeons way back in 1980. Um, and surgical instrument manufacturing, as I mentioned, you take up, a, you learn a lot of different crafts and skills along the way. And apprenticeships are the ideal way for, to do this. And, and we're advertising apprentice, apprenticeships. Currently, we have apprentices on board. So this is the way, this is what you end up, look, this is Terry. So he's obviously uh, many years on. So Terry is still our factory manager, obviously very happy to be a surgical instrument maker still. Let's look at the origins of instruments now and how they come about. Uh, and uh, another statement from, from my research that British surgical instrument makers have not on the whole been very innovative in the design of their products, which sounds quite harsh, but when you look at um, instrument designs from way back in the late 1800s, this was the original uh, Spencer Wells force of pressure forcep that, that was designed um, by the surgeon Spencer Wells. And, and the modern day equivalent of the Spencer Wells, you can see that not much has changed. So that probably is a, a relatively fair statement other than the introduction of um, the vital part of it, which is uh, the, the stainless steel. So that um, as, I, as I'll, uh, discuss a little later on how that how that came about but generally speaking the designs very very similar and um, you have uh, we've substituted a box joint for um, uh, for a lay on screw joint which arguably might be more favorable now because it can be easily taken apart and cleaned so surgical instruments have involved uh, over the years they've been used by the ancient Egyptians the Romans lots of evidence has been found of of surgical instruments that bear very similar resemblance to a lot of the tools we use nowadays. And um, although it might be said that there hasn't been much innovation in terms of how the, how the, the designs of the instruments have changed, this, the, the nature of how they're used is certainly changing now. Um, you'll see uh, a picture that's just flashed by there. Obviously, we, we have laparoscopic instruments and even robotic instruments now, but the instruments themselves are in principle are the same. They're just longer versions. So a laparoscopic instrument, it might be the same as the Spencer Wells we showed. You have an artery forcep, but it's just a longer version that's suitable for use in that robotic or laparoscopic surgery. So let's look at the nomenclature. What's in the name? Um, how, how does the name come about of a surgical instrument? generally follows a, a specific pattern. So it gives it the, the, the breakdown of the instrument, will give a description of the action of it performs, the name of its inventor, 
and um, perhaps a scientific name related to how how it's um, how it performs. So, for instance, Spencer Wells artery forceps, Spencer Wells being the surgeon, artery being the area of the area of the anatomy that the uh, device is used on, and um, obviously forceps being the type of um, the type of instrument itself. And that goes for a, 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 generally speaking, 99% of the instrumentation. So it starts with a medical issue. So here we see um, uh, an x-ray picture of uh, some poor lady or gent with a hip issue. So we describe this as osteo. Osteo meaning bone. And then we look at otomy, which is cut into the term otomy. Ostomy means create an opening. So there we have the cape and an osteotome. Obviously, you then can get a good understanding of the makeup of the words and where they come from. Obviously, osteo, osteo meaning bone. And then the other terms relating to creating an opening and cutting into. So it all becomes relatively um, common sense in relation to how the instruments are named. And Capener being the actual surgeon, who I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Um, another interesting quote here from my research that, in general, the typical surgical, make, typical surgical instrument maker seems to have been very conservative and to have deferred entirely to the whims of his customer, the surgeon. And I guess the fact that all instruments are generally named after a surgeon um, makes sense that, uh, that, of course, that they're generally the, the, um, the people who are using the instruments and therefore are named after us. This is, this is uh, Norman Cape, a very, very famous surgeon from Royal Endeavour, Royal Endeavour and Exeter, hugely famous for in orthopaedics, particularly hips. Um, and that's, uh, he's, he's um, obviously credited with a number of different instruments for uh, throughout orthopaedics. So as an instrument making company, this is the sort of thing that will be given for um, uh, when we come to make an instrument by, if we're initially asked by a surgeon, and this is actually a very good drawing, um, quite often it will be a, a very, very rough piece of paper that it starts with, with a sketch that the surgeon might have thought of. Um, and, um, and this gets passed over to us to, uh, to, to create a, perhaps a proper drawing or a pattern that we can then start to work to or create a, a working prototype. Of course, you would have to follow the, the relevant regulations. Nowadays, with um, the MDR in Europe, it's a bit tougher to do that than, than of course, it, than perhaps it used to be. Um, but it's very important that if a surgeon has a, a very good idea that that we um, that we look at it and um, it could be a, a great innovation that certainly enhances patient safety, which of course is is what we're doing this for. So that's that's essentially what we evolved it into. This is the Whitlow retractor. So we went from that, which is a, a basic ring uh, ring retractor picture, to to this. Um, so. You can see that obviously um, the, the initial idea was there, but obviously you're incorporating different elements of the design to come up with a final, um, the final device. So the same appears to true, true hold today in the willingness with which the British instrument may continues to produce fanciful and wholly uncommercial instruments. The design of the individual surgeons is legendary. Now this is a very interesting statement and we have seen this first time uh, at first hand a number of times where um, a surgeon or a clinician perhaps has an idea that they feel is um, is going to be a big hit um, and very very useful and it might be something that only they feel is useful for the way they perform a particular procedure so uh, this statement although it's back from the 80s is still very true and it's something that certainly now with the increasing costs in regulation you've got to be very very aware of when you're making instruments you can Google most surgeons' names, and you'll get uh, a great bit of background on on what they've what they've done, what they've achieved, the area of surgery they worked, and design and perhaps designs of devices they've come up with. Um, here we have Jules Emil Peen, who um, is credited with uh, things the Peen forceps and a number of other devices. So uh, it's well worth spending a bit of time if you wish to learn learn about various surgeons just simply by googling them. So let's have a look at understanding material selection and how we start to create the surgical instruments and what sort of materials we might be using. So here we have on our screen, and indeed I have a, a piece here, um, a picture, uh, this is a picture of iron ore. So this is actually a lump of iron ore which has been extracted from the ground. 
And the reason this picture is relevant is that iron ore uh, makes up the majority, or iron extracted from iron ore makes up the majority of the surgical instruments composition around 70 to 80 percent. Um, it would have other elements in it such as carbon, nickel, chromium, but iron is the basis of it. Um, and iron oxide is iron in its most stable state. So this is something we really have to understand and pay attention to when we're looking at trying to keep our um, surgical instruments in the best working condition. You'll, just to flip back to this previous slide, you'll want to pay particular attention to the colour and, and what that might represent as well. Probably something you've seen on, um, on various steel or iron implements over the, over the years in many different areas. So, of course, I mentioned that we take our iron ore and we, we smelt it and, and put other chemical elements and extract and, and basically to create the alloy, which is the stainless steel. And if we look at world iron ore mining, uh, here's a map here that I've um, that I've managed to find in my research. It could be seen that the majority of the iron ore, iron ore is mined over in the um, over in the Far East. So obviously it stands to reason that a lot of the steel now produced is over in those areas. You can see here, um, obviously China, India, Japan, United States, uh, South Korea, indeed Russia, all big steel producers. Naturally, of course, instruments, uh, forgings for instruments are also produced in those areas and those um, those parts of the world too. You know, of course, there is some steel that's produced in Germany still, forgings and um, that are produced from there in Europe, but obviously much lower than the big steel producers. And the key point, is to understand um, no matter where the steel is being manufactured, the standards that we must meet. So with surgical instrument manufacture, ISO 71553 is the important standard. Um, I think it's actually been upgraded since 2016, so this reference is slightly out of date. This is this gives you the compositions for every instrument, what types of steel they should be, um, and if you don't follow that, then you're unlikely to be able to produce an instrument that's fit for purpose. Other standards worth mentioning here, um, there are British standards for surgical instrument making. So these cover things such as scissors, shears, dissecting forceps, um, and a variety of other instruments. Details, British standards, tests, testing materials, testing matter. There's a German DIN standard, which is certainly more detailed than the British standard that's, that's definitely worth looking up. Um, uh, so that cites particular test materials which are which are available if you're looking at testing instruments and then of course you've got your regulation you've got the MDD uh, medical device directive which has now been obviously outdated by the MDR here in the UK we're still working to the medical device directive um, and indeed CE marking but watch this space for UK CA, CA marking which is which will now be taking place on surgical instruments Let's look at stainless steel and the origin of stainless steel. So dating back to uh, 1912, Harry Brearley of the Brown Firth Research Laboratory in Sheffield was actually looking for a suitable steel to make gun barrels and actually subsequently discovered martensitic stainless steel. Um, that's the alloy of martensitic stainless steel, uh, which turns out to be extremely suitable for surgical instruments as well due, due to its corros corrosion resistance and strength. And here's a here's a, a, a cross section showing um, the different compositions, different types of steel you might get. Here we have A through to D are the normal, normally the popular popular steels. Just to give a very brief overview, C here is the amount of carbon in. The higher the amount of carbon, um, the higher the hardness can be for the device. So here we have like a 0.42 there. That would be for something that might be like an osteotome or a chisel, very, very hard, or a B um, shows a low, much lower carbon. When you harden the device, it would be st you'd still want a bit of flexibility, so that's why it has less carbon. And this is generally offset by the CR, which is the chromium, which grows, goes up gradually here. So just to show, we have, um, oh, there we go. The osteotome I'm talking about, which is the which has the higher carbon, and that's these are the important factories to achieve this level of hardness. If you're manufacturing something like an osteotome, a chisel, or a gouge that's got a holding edge, it has to have that level of hardness, or it would just dent continuously after it's used, so it wouldn't be fit for purpose. So that's very very important. 
equally important is the um, is the chromium in the device. The chromium in the um, in the composition of the steel is what it allows it to oxidise and to passivate. So the term passivation you may be familiar with. Um, this is basically um, a chromium oxide reaction. Um, it's it's the chromium in the steel reacting with the oxygen, and you get a chromium oxide layer which is as little as 30 nanomicrons thick. Very, very susceptible to damage, scratching, and that can be that potential damage through laser marking. And passivation itself is a naturally occurring phenomenon and something that's great about myontitic steel. Um, in manufacturing, as an instrument maker, we can actually um, artificially achieve this by using um, acid. So it might be nitric acid, citric acid, that will passivate and oxidize the surface of the steel and create this layer that you're that you're looking for. But you'll only get that layer if you have exactly the amount of um, amount of chromium in the steel. So poor quality steels um, that aren't suitable for surgical instruments won't be able to achieve this. And this is the sort of thing you might see if that passive layer gets damaged. Um, is some um, evidence of rusting where water, water retention has. Um, where water has been retained on the instrument, perhaps when the rack of the device has been closed down. So you might be familiar with seeing this staining on the device, and that's where um, the passive layer of the steel is broken down. Another example is here, where is, um, you can see different pitting patterns that have started um, forming on the instrument. Obviously, this would be likely to have to be disposed of. And um, just, to, just to say a bit about pitting corrosion, Generally, um, this will only uh, only occur in the presence of chloride. So, um, if you've got chloride in your wash water, uh, that um, if you if you if you use a potable water and you haven't got a treatment plant, or there's still for some reason high chlorides, if uh, the instrument that gets damaged, the surface of the instrument, you'll see here um, that you have. Uh, essentially a little hole so this could this would start very very small so this imagine this is your um, passive layer that's been damaged you then get this corrosion product form this very very small pit becomes the uh, becomes the anode and um, the outer bigger surface area of the device therefore becomes cathodic and um, the electrolyte which is the chloride is a, is a tr is actually attracted to the anode so you get like this unstoppable um, process then of the electrolyte having a reaction and um, this corrosion product being produced. So something certain to, certainly to be aware of, um, the, the anions and the electrolyte are, are attracted to, naturally attracted to the, uh, to the pit, uh, as we can see here. So something that um, I think we do sometimes see on surgical instruments and there are other, other corrosion issues to be aware of as well. So this is the sort of thing we might see if we see chloride stamp chloride damaged you'll see um, a little pit form in there and, and a ring that's stained around the um, the instrument perhaps where the the chlorides attack the surface and just going back to I mentioned about the the coloring of of, um, of iron ore so you'll see a very familiar obviously orange color that we associate with rust well that is because basically rust is the most comfortable stable um, uh, the, it, it's it's um, it, essentially um, iron plus oxygen plus water equals hydrated iron oxide. So it's in its most sta its stable form, um, iron. So that's why it's so important to be aware of things like what's in the steel, the fact there's a lot of iron in it. You also the fact that you're passivating the stainless steel, and if that if that passivation gets damaged, then there's a very high chance you might end up seeing something perhaps not as drastic as these bolts, but Obviously, just to bear in mind and it's a reminder that the colours are the same. And these are the sort of challenges that we have um, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the UK. Um, obviously, just Wales and England pictured here, but these are the variety of different potable water that we get throughout the, um, throughout the UK. Lots of different sources and, uh, and therefore you have lots of different mineral contents. So if we look at, for instance, um, Cambridge and London, very high alkalinic, alkalinity. Cambridge particularly has also high chloride, so you'd want to have treated water sources in those in those hospitals, otherwise you could risk damaging the instruments, as we mentioned. And water can come from lots and lots of different sources too. So obviously we're talking about from a sterile services perspective here, it can come from taps, immersion, water disinfector, steam generator. I mean, generally in England, um, you would have uh, 
RO reverse osmosis, osmosis water plants in um, uh, in your for your steam, obviously to prevent any sort of water staining or, or other mineral contaminants. But there might be other areas of water that are used that don't have that. Let's have a little look at manufacturing techniques now. So here we have um, this is in our stores some patterns. This is as surgical instrument makers when we're making instruments, um, we have a pattern that we look to replicate. Sorry, excuse me. And the reason that's important and why we don't just have drawings is that obviously feeling the weight and um, for things like cut on scissors, set on artery forceps, um, all very important. So it's really, really important to hold a physical pattern and be able to see that and look at that when you're the instrument maker. We do have drawings and this is what a drawing might look like, um, but you'd want a drawing and a pattern. And you, as an instrument maker, you do your due diligence. You you have um, you get raw materials, as I've mentioned, raw materials might come in from all over the world nowadays, and of course they have to be to the right standard. So this is what we, as a manufacturer, do. We would test the materials to make sure that they're to the correct specification. So for our customers, we ensure that they get in the right material to the right standard. A few of the processes that we go through when we're making surgical instruments. Now let's let's start from the um, the very the very beginning, um, and that's drop forging. So that's getting a, a, a billet of stainless steel, essentially heating it up. So I'm just scrambling around looking for my props here. Essentially heating it up, and then um, forging it. So this is like a, a big power press that forging and and hammering it and and uh, into shape. So uh, I'll show you in a minute what I might talk about. Once that forging process has taken place and you have a forging, for instance, uh, this is a forging of, um, of a needle holder or one half of a needle holder, that would be annealed to soften it. That's allow you to work it. Uh, I can prove it's soft by bending it because I'm not very strong. So there we go. And um, these are lots of the different forging, what we call bosses, uh, essentially the templates that when the forging is being carried out, these are used to achieve the different shapes. These are probably quite outdated, some old ones that we have, but just to give you an example. So here we have our two forging pieces. And the other technique which might be used, and as, as an instrument maker, as a craftsman, you have to use many different techniques. I've mentioned is heating up and spreading and bending. So we have a piece of steel here that we're heating up. We get it to the, um, the required color and then start to work that with a mallet. This is called spreading. So here, uh, Reese is hammering the, uh, the piece of steel and spreading it out, getting it to the required shape. I was hoping there was a finishing image there, but it hasn't come through. Um, getting it to the required shape, and, and then he can go and use this for whatever might be required. It might be, he might be turning it into a into a chisel or, or um, another piece of a, another particular instrument. But it's just to show the, the sort of skills we use that very, very similar to a, to a blacksmith, as I mentioned. Milling and grinding, of course, is used. So um, in the factory, we have big milling machines. And you'll see that the forgings, which look like that, are then milled across in this section to cut out the box joints. You can even see the mill cutter that's gone through there. And that's in much better detail there where you can see a real good close up of it. And eventually you end up with your finished articulated device like that. But but it is in two pieces. It comes from forging and and that um, forging process is how, how it's produced. Some other techniques that we use manufacturing in the factory. We use lathes. So here in the picture, we're making some handles using a lathe. Drilling and reaming, of course, is a, a very, I guess, fairly basic um, process, but that's used a lot. Here we're drilling some mallets, some handles, some mallets, putting some holes in them to make them lighter. TIG welding um, is something that I learned uh, way back when I was a, um, a scrawny teenager in that picture. Uh, so here we're welding up some, um, uh, some square heady retractors. But welding, of course, is very, very useful when you want to join two pieces of metal, and of course, uh, then it gives strength and you use filler rod which would be the same compatible steel that you're actually um, manufacturing the device out of that's vitally important 
hand chipping is something that we do here at Surgical Holdings. This is us making a, um, a hip rasp. Uh, you'll see the um, the teeth that are being chipped out there. Uh, very, very intricate to very, very high high tolerances. But again, it's um, it's a hand skill using a mallet and and a and a, and a steel tool piece essentially. Laser welding is something that's used a lot now on surgical instruments, which is a is a a great benefit to surgical instruments. Um, previously, I'm hoping I get a better sh shot here. So previously, this things like these um, these racks here would have been potentially left open, so there would have been a gap around them. They might have been soldered, which also isn't very isn't particularly great because it's not not a particularly biocompatible material. But now we use laser welding, so in my opinion, any gap on a surgical instrument that <clears throat> isn't moving should be laser welded to prevent ingress of moisture, bacteria, debris. Very, very important point. We use a lot of finishing wheels. So here we have a scurf wheel, which is a very, very rough um, finishing wheel, which allows us to take things like weld off and dress weld. Of course, grinding. Um, picture of us grinding a scissor here. Specialized sharpening wheels. We have many, many different sharpening wheels for uh, for surgical for um, for surgical instruments. So this one, particularly for scissors, you have specific grinding wheels for things like supercut scissors. Obviously, they have a certain edge that have been put there by the um, by the manufacturer. So we have to follow that. Um, just to show what a supercut scissor looks like. So it's one side is a serrated edge, and the other side is a really ultra uh, ultra sharp um, razor edge and the idea being that the um, serrated edge grips the tissue while the really sharp edge cuts it so to do that you have to have particular wheels to sharpen the scissors on setting bending and bench fitting we're, we're using brass here because it don't, won't damage the instrument but it allows us to intricately bend and set the devices uh, here we're repairing um, uh, a um, dissecting forcep and using uh, our hand skills achieve putting the right set and putting the instrument back to the the set it should be when it's manufactured you'll see a few different colors on on surgical instrument trays nowadays um, you might get a gold that's a titanium nitride coating i'm holding up here and you can see and uh, the picture here this sort of bronzy color that's also titanium nitride um, that's this is uh, particularly this was coated for identification to to allow identification of instruments on a set you might get kerosene rongers that have a similar titanium nitride, a black version of that coating. Um, that's generally used for reduction of friction and um, and improving the hardness of the device because those coatings are much, much harder. So they make for a much more robust um, instrument. That's why they're generally more expensive. Uh, other, You might see some other coatings. Generally, they're not really suitable for surgical instruments. Um, some blue surgical instrument you'll see you'll see will be titanium. They are okay to be dyed blue, um, but generally speaking, you're probably going to see gold and black. And it's another example of black on surgical instruments. But when you get on on the bows of scissors, here the two black bows uh, that, are, that are showing uh, super, uh, designate that it's a supercut strabismus scissor. So this is um, another chemical process that's on the black bows, and it's not as robust as um, as the titanium nitride. So you'll you'll probably get a few, a few scratches and things like that on these on these particular types of coatings. That's really because they're just there for identification to tell you that it's a supercut edge. And just in summary, you'll see um, coatings being used for identification again here. Two gold bows, as it does on needle holders, generally means there's a tungsten carbide insert. In, in this case, it's on the scissor. Um, one black, one gold means supercut tungsten carbide. Uh, one black bow on the left ring, left-handed scissor, and and there and there, and that is more or less what you'll see in relation to scissors. I mentioned the gold coatings already. Very very important part for generally repairs and of course manufacture is induction brazing. This is on uh, when you're manufacturing needle holders and you have your needle holder forging, you use a particular flux and you use this coil to induction braze the um, uh, the actual um, the insert into the needle holder itself. So you'll see the picture on the right there, which is being obscured by my control panel at the moment, um, is a, of a 
different of a serration pattern that you'd probably see on something like a, a Mayo Hagar needle holder. Obviously, you'd get lots of different varieties of those, and I'll show you some more in, in an image in a moment. But the important part is using this process, only that area of the device heats up. We don't want the rest of the device heat, heating up unnecessarily because that process we've gone through when we're manufacturing an instrument may be harmed. And of course, these are the different sort of needle holders, uh, forgings that you get. Final polishing and finishing, hugely important nowadays when we're looking at corrosion resistance, ensuring that bacteria doesn't sit on the instruments and it can be washed off, uh, really improving the effort, cleaning the efficacy of the devices. Um, we do a lot of work on this. Research has shown that, um, of course, the smoother the surface, um, the better the instrument will clean, the, the better the cor corrosion resistance. And this is all about surface area. Um, if the if the surface of the instrument is rougher, which is a much easier, cheaper what cheaper way to um, to finish an instrument is just by having a rough surface and then just sandblasting it so you can't see it. The real work goes into hand finishing and um, polishing and taking that roughness away down to this sort of finish you'll see on the bottom one, and then you get the best results in terms of corrosion resistance. So we, we're really just reducing the surface area by by polishing it, and thereby. Um, decreasing the wettability so as the droplets of the water land on the instrument they'll they'll run off quicker because they've got less less to grip onto it's as simple as that so our instruments using the utilizing this design principle we actually have a duo finish so we have a really high-end bright polished finish uh, on all the distal ends of the instruments and then we have a satin anti-glare at the back and that's the reason for it so finally a process that will be carried out is vacuum hardening on the on your instruments so obviously I've run through lots of different processes, but ultimately we've got our forging. Our forging has particular chemicals in it to allow it to be vacuum hardened. The main, the, the one that is key to that is carbon. Obviously, if it's got a higher carbon level, it will become the device will come up harder. So um, what have I got here? So something like a Ronja will be um, made out of a, a, a higher carbon steel than something like an artery forcep. This is a process that generally, um, unless obviously you're a huge company, you'd send out to have be carried out by um, a professional vacuum hardening company, and that's what a vacuum hardening machine looks like. Laser marking is uh, one of the other final processes. Obviously important to have things like CE, the CE mark on your device, the company name, and this is generally all done under laser marking. As I've mentioned earlier, the, the importance of laser marking Obviously, firstly, is, is, is to identify the instrument and to um, to ensure that we can trace it back if there's any problems with the instrument or if there's any issues. Um, but generally speaking, if you laser mark into the surface of a steel, um, there are some techniques on laser markers, I must add, that don't need this. Um, that, uh, but but at, from our experience, we would then passivate the instrument after to uh, to oxidize the surface of the steel. And, and that just ensures that any free iron is taken out. Um, as I mentioned, there are some laser markers that, that now don't really require, um, may not require this. And um, that's because they carry out an oxidization process after they've marked. So the technology is improving all the time. Packing and labeling, of course, is very, very important. And we might just think of it as putting the device in, um, in uh, some protective plastic, which, Obviously, if we're talking about sustainability, we've got to look to improve our um, how we're packing instruments all the time, um, and that those materials we're using are fully recyclable, um, which from our perspective they are. Um, however, we're often asked around sustainability, but you've got to have a balance between protecting the device to ensure that when it ends up at the hospital to be used on a patient, it isn't damaged during transit, because of course, ultimately we've got to protect the patient we're using on the um, we're using the device on. Labelling of, uh, is of equal importance, having really important symbols. If the device was sterile or non-sterile, um, that could that would be in, um, indicated on it if it was single use. Um, if there were any special storage conditions. So vi uh, very important to pay attention to the, the specific international standards that tell you what those different symbols are. And let's just run through how um, how we make an instrument. And this is one that we've manufactured recently, um, a Voltman retractor here. So we have the forging on the left that we've um, milled a slot in. This is the pattern we're working to, I've mentioned. 
Um, first of all, the handle um, is filed. We've got a, a seam running around the handle here that is filed away. You'll see the seam there. That's what it looks like after it's been filed. So bench fitting there, I mentioned hand skills used by the surgical instrument manufacturer. And um, then that is filed round uh, using different, um, obviously different coarseness of, uh, of files and uh, potentially emery cloths to make it smoother. And then we look at uh, the actual working end itself. Here we have another brass piece and the device will be heated up and bent over and it looks like that. And then sharpened. So obviously now we're getting the, seeing the features of the, of the finished device that we recognize. And there we have it. So just to give you a, a run through of um, the, the type of processes that, that would be followed. And commercialization is of course, as I mentioned, really important. Once we've made the device, we've got to work out if it's going to be um, if it's going to be sellable. Of course, it's got to be safe. It's got to be to the right regulation, be that MDR or UKCA. So that's what will allow us to legally sell it. But is there actually a market for it? Is there anybody who wants to buy it? Um, and um, is there? Uh, is, is it just going to be a one-off? Will it be for one particular surgeon? So all these considerations need to be built in, particularly as the cost is so high when you're manufacturing instruments nowadays. So one thing you might consider is producing some catalogues and putting some of your instruments in the catalogues when you start to commercialize them and promote them. Here's what our catalog looks like. Um, this is a process we went through for our hip instruments recently, which are, uh, which are currently popular. So we have now a hip instrument catalog produced and of course we'll go and take this to end users and talk about the products we sell and discuss them so obviously um, that's part of the commercialization process i just want to touch on something we haven't mentioned which is just we talked about lots of different processes that go into instrument manufacture um, but just really the different features that you get with instruments um, and there's there's such a huge variety but but they are often uh, appearing on lots of different instrument types. So for instance, box box joints, you'll see an artery forceps, needle holders, screw joints, of course, on scissors, ratchets on a lot of retractors, um, very different self-retaining retractors, Travers, West, Wheatland, and Norfolk and Norwich. Um, teeth, these are what teeth look like when we're referring to teeth. So you might get one into two teeth, two into three, three into four. So these are Alice tissue, uh, Alice tissue forceps, Littlewoods tissue forceps, lots of different tissue forceps that have these very intricate teeth that have to be hand finished, <clears throat> excuse me, and hand fold in. And the term rack, um, other people might say ratchet, uh, of course found on needle holders as well and lots of other different um, artery forceps. Scissor blades, fairly obvious one. Lumens, uh, generally on suction tubes, and I guess some other laparoscopic instruments might be regarded as having lumens. Um, they uh, obviously notoriously can be quite tricky to clean and you have to make sure you're using the correct brushes. Um, this is something that's quite important. I just wanted to highlight here on artery forceps and maybe some artery clamps, you'll get different sort of teeth. So you here you'll see these teeth here, which are serrated, which are more coarsely serrated and familiar with things you might see on Spencer Wells needle holders, those sort of um, basic products. And, and on the finer instruments that are used on thor in thoracics and cardio, CVT, you get these, um, uh, you get a traumatic teeth, which is essentially the same thing, but uh, an area, areas of clearance ground off each side to reduce the surface area that's in, in contact with the, um, with the patient tissue. So atraumatic teeth really important when using in delicate areas because we're trying to apply less trauma and that's the reason. So let's look at validation. Again we're talking about commercializing the device, hugely important and this is the reason why um, I mentioned I showed a kerosene ronja a minute ago. Um, some rongers can be quite difficult to clean and this is an instance of a kerosene ronja where um, that what no maintenance was carried out on it, so it was found to have this carbonized bio burden inside it. That's blood, basically, dry blood that um, drops into a patient wound and, and causes a surgical site infection. Now, that's certainly something we don't want. Um, just to 
show that there are better designs out there now. This kerosene Ronja here has cutouts in. This is a particular wave design. It's been validated to show that it can be cleaned using this wave design. You'll see the um, cutouts there. And of course, there's other trigger action types of kerosene Ronja as well that come apart completely for cleaning. So obviously, when you're thinking about designing an instrument, um, start with how it's going to be cleaned, because ultimately that's equally as important as um, as how it's going to be used because if it can't be clean then it can potentially um, harm people uh, through through infection so having good IFUs tell them if you if you've if you've designed a clever device tell them how to take it apart um, we've got an arrow here saying release on this one here which is a, hopefully a bit of a giveaway um, but that's something that's advancing all the time and you need to actually validate your devices to prove that they can be cleaned and pro then provide a particular process in which the hospital can follow to clean it. You might consider using things like baskets that um, have different layouts in to, um, to ensure that firstly the devices are protected and won't be damaged. You'll see this basket is actually a handset. Um, it's got some very very fine uh, hooks and other instruments with very very fine ends such as the alms here so they're put in silicone to protect them to preserve the instruments and also hopefully um, improve the, the cleanliness of the instruments instruments <coughs> excuse me <coughs> so just referring back to um, our journal article that I mentioned at the start of the presentation, interesting to pull a comment out here, as we've just has been discussing about uh, layouts of, and fixation in trays, case making was a separate trade, a minor specialised branch of cabinet making. The case maker had two major customers, so we're talking about laying out cases in which to put things. So the two major customers were surgical, surgical instrument, instrument maker and the gunsmith. So again, there's a crossover not only in the steel that, that was found to be good uh, for use with making firearms, but it's also good for surgical instruments, but it's the same for the cases. So um, I also go on to say, from the outside, it's almost impossible to distinguish a case made to accommodate a pair of pistols from one made to house surgical instruments, which is a very, very interesting comment. And and you can see how actually this, this is our, uh, a picture of actually um, uh, an instrument case which has got which is essentially a whole surgery set here that we have in our factory. Um, it's actually a family heirloom that was passed down to my father from his uncle. Um, amazing display of uh, workmanship with a special uh, cabinet laid out with a layout of the instruments here. Really was ahead of its time and now we're going back and doing things like this again. So we'd already done it. Um, the designs were already out there, they were being used and, and when we went away from using it and now we're going back to doing things so like this. So. This is a really, really interesting artifact, and anybody who comes to visit us is welcome to see it. So what does the future give for surgical instruments? We've already said that the surgical instrument maker isn't particularly innovative and doesn't come up with many new devices, although we've seen that, of course, um, stainless steel was used and the materials have changed, although that hasn't changed for over 100 years. So we're now looking at robotics. We have um, a so a surgical robot that's being man manufactured here in the UK by CMR Versius. So as I mentioned, this is advancing the use of the designs of the instruments that have been around for uh, many, many years, but just in a very, very long format with um, attached to a robotic arm. Different materials are coming available, so carbon fibre uh, and things like carbon fibre are very useful because they're very, very strong, very robust, radiolucent. So you can have an x-ray with them on and uh, they don't affect the x-ray. The prohibitive issue at the moment and whenever I've talked to people about things like sustainability in instruments and they say well you know we have to get stainless steel from the other side of the world, could we not use a different material, could we 3D print something, you know, carbon fiber, it's cost and, and ultimately stainless steel is a, is a material that's available and um, it's very very fit for purpose in relation to surgical instruments provided it's maintained so that's why there aren't too many breakthrough materials. Um, I think I showed a picture earlier of a, a blue handle. So you get some medical plastics that are used for some uh, for some areas of instruments, but quite often there might be things like handles, um, certainly not probably working ends. 
coatings uh, are very interesting i find very interesting personally um, i love the idea that nano coatings can be applied so here we have a, a coated scissor this is a titan a form of titanium nitride that you can see it's coated where you've got the the cut off where when it's been coated someone's just done that um but there's a next step with these coatings and that's uh, taking them to a nano stage so ultimately um imagine the surface of a, a antimicrobial wound dressing currently if it's coated at a, a normal scale with antimicrobial material uh, increasing this to a nano scale makes it a thousand times more effective so we're talking potentially about doing that it's on surgical instruments this could be very interesting for instruments perhaps that um, maybe are involved in procedures that uh, have a high infection rate so certainly something to explore but again cost is a big factor medical plastics I mentioned I forgot I had that slide and finally just to touch on um, repairs and refurbishments uh, this is a uh, after and before obviously the, the wrong way around here but this is a mallet that we repaired just to show that once you have the skills of a surgical instrument maker which I've ran through a lot of the different um, features of the surgical instrument maker being able to refurbish devices if you know how to manufacture something you know how to repair it and to repair it to the standard it's required for the manufacturer and that's the important part we can't just repair stuff um, to a to a poor quality that's going to affect patients that um, obviously patient safety it's going to also cost a lot um, when you then have to replace the stuff immediately so but certainly refurbishment is to um is, is very very important and you can take these things like this mallet here you can regrind it refinish it you're, you're reflecting back to the slide I showed where you can um, obviously grind the steel back to a very very fine finish reducing down the surface fin surface area again improving the corrosion resist corrosion resistance improving the potential for protein to sit on the instrument so all very positive stuff so just to finish up before we go to questions and to summarize instruments are crafted by makers technicians names of the devices generally come from the inventors the surgeons we have to determine if there's a commercial viability if we're asked to manufacture a device is it likely to go anywhere or is it just going to be for one surgeon and it's maybe the cost will be prohibitive iron makes up the major a majority of the composition as one takeaway remember that because that's hugely important when you look at your instruments and you wonder why it's rust spots on them and that's because the majority of them are iron and if the surface gets damaged then that's free iron that will leach um, and and create rust when they're washed so really important to bear that in mind particularly when you're taking care of the instruments and making sure things like preventive maintenance are put in place passivation of steel is crucial has to be done really really vital part to protect the surface of the steel a majority of instruments come from forgings Fortunes like this, this one for the needle holder that I just showed. Um, so that's the majority of the basic instruments will come from those sort of forgings. Many instruments have not have not changed designs, uh, of course, to reflect back to the Spencer Wells, but the technology to manufacture them has. Um, bringing now bringing in things like laser laser welding, CNC manufacture, obviously increases the speed and scale that we can manufacture devices so so yeah certainly things have changed um, in that respect a variety of craft processes are used that are hand skills that are important to be passed on through generations through apprenticeships um, that's very very key for uh, the succession of our industry and consideration must be given to, to sustainability um, and uh, and safety and patient safety Thank you very much for listening really appreciate your attention and hopefully i've covered everything you wanted to hear in the session um please send over questions and um just a reminder if there aren't many questions once you come off of the um uh, once you come off of the webinar you should hopefully automatically get a um uh, get a, a survey come through just asking some basic questions It'll take a couple of minutes to run through it and then I can register you for the CPD um, certificate that you'll then get automatically from CPD directly. Uh, let's have a look if we've got any questions coming through. I have a question here from Andrew and I, I won't say second names just to an anonymize in case anybody doesn't want that. 
Um, and Andrew said, is decontamination of the instruments considered early in the design stage? Um, yeah, well, I mean, as a manufacturer, we, we would consider it early if we were designing a new instrument, particularly now. And I think that's really just because everyone's much, much more aware of it um, and aware of the importance of it. So I hope that that um, will continue as a as a trend that if people are designing instruments that they firstly consider what the material is they're using, if it's suitable for the use of the device, but also is it suitable for um, uh, for the ongoing ongoing decontamination? Can the device be taken apart correctly? If you remember, I showed the picture of the Spencer Wells, which had the screw joint, um, which was like a lay-on screw joint, which arguably was a better um, uh, was a better design for taking apart and cleaning. Someone's put a comment. Are we still um, still making single-use instruments? Personally, we're a, we're a reusable company instrument uh, company. Uh, we're I'll try again. We're a reusable instrument company. We generally don't make single-use instruments. There are, of course, single-use instruments um, being manufactured and. Uh, things like suction tubes, um, the instruments that are difficult to clean, of course, makes perfect sense to use them for, for single use where patient safety is, is very, very important. Um, any more questions, please? I think I've answered all the ones that are up there at the moment. Just give it a couple more moments before signing off. Okay, we don't seem to have any other questions coming through. Apologies if there could be issues with the software and then all of a sudden I do get questions come through, but you can, you're welcome to email them directly through to me. There's my email address on the screen. So please, please feel free to do that if you wish to as an, as an alternative. Um, great. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and thanks for joining us. This is, is, this is our second webinar of the year. So the first one was on rigid endoscopes. I think the next one's probably likely to be on flexible endoscopes. So we'll be sharing the date. If you've registered for this, we'll share the date with you for that as well. But yeah, thank you very, very much for joining us. Oh, sorry. Typically I've got, oh, Jack is, I thought I was adding one more comment, but no. Great. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye.